Hi, everyone. This is uh, Fahim Niaz. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm the product manager for Anime Studio. And uh, this is lesson two of our free four-part webinar training series that will take you through the steps of creating a basic animation project using Anime Studio. Chad Trofgruben of Incredible Tutorials will be presenting the series. He's an expert on creating tutorials and is an avid animator who has in-depth knowledge of Anime Studio. His tutorials have been viewed by thousands, so we're very pleased to have him here. As you heard earlier, Michi Katniss is our moderator. She's having some uh, voice difficulties, um, so please bear with us. Uh, sometimes that happens with WebEx. So <clears throat> the topic of this uh, webinar, how to create scenery using a variety of tools in Anime Studio. Uh, all attendees will be muted, and there will be a Q&A at the very end. Uh, so type in your questions in the Q&A window and address to all panelists if you have other questions as well. Uh, so uh, let's get this started. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I see we have another great turnout here today, so hopefully this should be fun and educational for you. So in this uh, particular lesson, we'll be focusing on how to create a simple background or a piece of scenery for the cartoon. And I'm going to be doing an outside shot for this. So to get started, make sure that you have a new document open in Anime Studio. If you don't, all you have to do is go to File and New to create a new document. And once you do that, let's go over here to the right on our Layers panel and double click to rename Layer 1. It's always good to name our layers so we know what each layer is and it just helps with organizational purposes. We will name this layer Sky. So just type Sky into the name box and then click OK. Now, we'll come over here to the Draw Shape tool, which is on our left toolbar. And when we click that, at the top we have some options. We have Auto Fill and Auto Stroke, and we have some shapes we can select. Let's leave Auto Fill on, but let's take off Auto Stroke. So just click on the checkbox to deselect that. And all that will do is it will just um, get rid of the function of drawing a line around the object, which we really don't need for the sky since it's just going to be a solid color background. So once you've done that, click the rectangle icon. And now come over here to the right on your style panel, and you can choose some colors. So first, we don't need to deal with the stroke since we deselected auto stroke. So we'll go right away to the fill color. So we'll select fill. And let's choose a light blue. I'm going to make my scene a daytime shot. Now, you have, of course, free reign over this. You can make it a nighttime shot, an evening shot, whatever you want. This is your project in the end. So make sure you just set a color that you want to use for the sky. And we can also apply a gradient to this, which I'll show you momentarily. So I have my light blue color, and I'll click OK. So now, I will simply come over here to the top left corner where my boundaries are. I'm just going to go a little bit outside the boundary. And I'm just going to click and drag to create a rectangle. So now, as I said, I want to create a gradient. If you choose to create a gradient, you can do that by all means. So I'll just show you how to do it. So let's first click on the Select Shape tool on the left toolbar and simply click on the rectangle. And now, coming over here to the um, right style panel, you'll see that you have an effect drop-down menu. Just click that and choose Gradient. Now, I know some of this is a repeat from last week's episode, or lesson, I should say. I just like to go over this stuff, especially for beginners, just so you guys know where everything is and just so you know all the explanations for everything and all that. But now we're in the gradient panel and you can choose all different types of gradients. We'll keep it to linear because linear will allow us to go from one side to the other with our color as you can see on the preview window right here. So we want to select a light blue color and then a dark blue color. So let's select or double click the white tab on your color slider and choose a light blue. 
And then on the black tab, we will choose a dark blue. And again, you can choose any range of colors you want for your own sky. And once you've done that, click OK. You'll now have a gradient applied to the rectangle, and you can adjust it, again, with the Select Shape tool, which should still be selected. What you have to do is you have to adjust this line with the two circles. So if we click and drag this full circle down, you'll see that we can move the gradient up and down. And as we do this, the gradient changes the way it looks. If we click and drag the top one here, we can extend the size of the gradient. And the further up we go, the more light color we have. And the further down we go, you see the gradient come more into play with the dark and light clashing. So you can adjust that, and once you've done that, you can just click off to see what it looks like. And again, I'm just going to do a very simple, just left to right, and I'm not going to really increase this much beyond the boundaries of my rectangle. So now, once you have done that, we have the sky in place. But there is one more thing I would like you to do with the sky. Later on, in uh, lesson four, we'll be working with camera movements. And it's important that the sky stays stationary when we're moving the camera around. So I'll have you apply a feature right now so we don't have to deal with it or worry about it in lesson four when we start moving our camera around. So all you have to do is come over here to your right layer panel and double click on the sky layer. Now, all the way at the bottom, you'll see a section called Options. Just click Immune to Camera Movements, and then click OK. This will now set this object, and again, you're not going to see any effect right now, but later on, when we do Lesson 4, you'll see that the object stays in place while we move the camera around. So next, let's draw the ground for this scene. So we'll come over here to the right on our Layers panel and click New Layer and choose Vector. A vector layer is essentially a drawing layer. So now we'll name this Ground and hit Enter. Coming over here now to the Add Point tool, which is on our left toolbar. We can come up here to some options, and we'll leave all these options checked except for sharp corners. So just click on that box to deselect sharp corners if it was selected on your screen. Now, we will come over here to the right style panel. And for the stroke color, we'll choose a dark brown. because so I'm going to make a dirt. Actually, I'm going to make the grass first. I'm going to switch my mind here a little bit. We'll make the grass first. So let's choose a dark green color and then click OK. And then for the fill color, we'll choose a light green, or a lighter green than that of the stroke at least. So we'll do something about like that and click OK. And you can have a gradient for this if you wish. I'm choosing not to, so I'll just make it plain for right now. Now coming over here to the stage, we'll start right about here so that we're near the middle of the sky. And we can just start drawing like this. And if you'll remember from last week, if you attended last week, with the Add Point tool, all you're doing is just dragging your points and laying them down. And then you start a new point from the existing point, as you can see I'm doing. And then you just keep drawing the way you want to draw, just like that. And now with the Add Point tool, we need to close the object off. So basically, we need to create a point that links to the first point. In this case, I'll just go like this and just draw it down. And then I'll come over like this and then come up like this. And that will then snap into place and we will now have the ground. Now, of course, we have stuff coming outside of our boundaries. But you've got to remember, what you're seeing here, that purple boundary is what the audience will see. And to further demonstrate that, you can go to File, Preview, and you can see now what the audience will see when you are completed with your project. You can see that we don't have any of that stuff on the outside. So now that we have the ground, 
we can now concentrate on the road, which was what I was about to jump ahead to. So let's come over here to the vector layer, um, the new vector layer settings. So we'll go over here to the right and click new layer and choose vector. And we can name this road. So now with the add point tool still selected, we can come over here to the right style panel, click on stroke, and choose a dark brown. So something like that. Because I'm going to be making a dirt road for this. And now I'll click on fill. And we'll choose a lighter brown, probably a little bit more red-ish brown. And a little bit more. Something like that. And we'll click OK. So now I'll start right about here on my screen. And I'll just do again what I just did with the ground. I'll just add some points down to create a wavy looking line. Because again, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfectly straight. And then I'll just come down and over and up to create the road. And if we want to be symmetrical with this, we can always click on the scale points tool, which is on our left toolbar. And we can enlarge it if we wish, just so that we have some room to play with if you need it. And that's always a good um, rule to have as well, especially if you're doing camera movements, which you'll see in the fourth lesson. So I won't get too far into that whole explanation right now. So now that we have the ground laid out, let's apply some details to the ground. Um, we can apply some lines, and I can show you how to use some brush effects for these lines. You could make the details on the road itself. I like to use many different layers, though, because it helps me organize. So feel free to add the details to the road itself, or come over here to your Layers panel and choose New Layer and make a vector graphic. And we can name this Road Details. Now, coming over here to the left toolbar, select your Freehand tool. And then we'll come over here to the right style panel. And we can leave the stroke color the same because we want a darker brown. But you can make a variant of that if you wish. And I will increase the width of my line to 8. And where it says no brush, let's click on the no brush box. And you'll notice that we have all sorts of different brush types we can use. There's stuff that looks a little bit messy, almost like a crayon or a piece of chalk. You can do stars. You can do things that look like vines. You can do all sorts of different things like that. Let's select one of the first three, because those look a little bit dirty, and that's kind of what we want for the road. So I'll select the second one in, and then click OK. Now I'll zoom in, and if you don't know how to do that, you can use the magnifying glass on your toolbar, or you can use the roller on your mouse, that mouse wheel, if you happen to have one. So we can zoom in. And to move the workspace, you can use this hand icon and just click and drag around, or you can right click on your mouse button, hold it down, and drag like this, which is what I do. So now that we have a view of the road with our free hand tool, let's just come in here and just make some lines like this. And they can vary in size and shape, if you wish. And to switch it up, we can come back here to the Style panel. And let's put 4 in as the number. And just hit Enter and continue to draw some lines. And now we have some skinnier lines coming into play here. Just add a little bit more variety to what we're doing. And you can do the same by changing colors as well. And I will change the line size one more time. I'll go to, and I'll just add a few more lines in like this. OK. And you could add more details on the outsides of this. And you may have to do that when we do the camera pans in the next lesson. But I'll leave it like this for right now. And that can be your homework <laughs> until lesson four, is to create 
your lines to go outside the roads and just to give a little bit more room to work with when we um, approach lesson four. So now that we have the lines set down for the road, there is one more thing we can do as far as organizing our layers because right now we essentially have two layers for the road. We have the road itself and the details. Well, this might be a pain if we need to move both layers. We can do it, and I showed you how to do that in the first lesson with the character. But let's make it easier on ourselves. Come up here to the Layers panel and choose the New Layer button, and select Group. We'll now have a folder that looks like, or a layer, I should say, that looks like a folder. And let's name this folder Road Group. What this will do is it'll allow us to put these two road layers into the road group. So let's just click on the road details layer and hold in shift and click on the road then as well. That will allow us to select both layers. And then just click and drag those road layers into the road group. So now these road pieces are part of the group. So if I ever move the group with my translate layer tool, you'll see that all the pieces move with it. As opposed to, if I were just to grab the row details and move that around, you'll see that it just moved the details. So that's just one way to organize things and keep things simple. And also, the road and road details work in their own hierarchy in that folder. So for instance, you can't really move the road details below the ground. You would have to actually move the whole group below the ground in order to achieve that effect. But of course, we don't want to do that, so I'll just move that back up. OK, so now let's move on to the fence. We'll create a fence since this is kind of a country-looking area. It'll be a wood fence. So first, let's um, make a new group layer, because I will have this be a group layer as well. So let's go to the New Layer button on our right Layers panel and choose Group. And I can name this Fence Group. And then I'll create two layers in that. So let's make a new vector layer. And I'll name it horizontal posts. And then we can just click and drag and move that right in there. And then I will make a, another vector layer and choose that to be vertical posts. Just like that. And if that didn't pop into your group layer like it did for me, just make sure you just put it into the group layer, just like that. OK, now come over here to the left toolbar and select the Add Points tool and select the Sharp Corners option at the top along with your Auto Weld and Auto Fill. So just select that. And now come over here to your Style panel. I'm going to choose a line width of 4. That's kind of my default line width and you can choose whatever line width you wish, but I'll set mine to four. And then choose a stroke. We want it to be dark brown again, but we want it to be a little bit different looking. So I'll just come over here and place it there. It's almost more of a dark gray, but that'll work. And then for the fill color, again, I want something light brown like this. And just click OK. And for the brush type, make sure we set that to plain. So I'll just click on that splotch box, as it looks like, and just choose None and click OK. So now, starting right around here, because again, I want to leave some wiggle room for the camera movements in Lesson 4, I'm going to start with the vertical post layer. So make sure you're selected on the vertical post layer in your layers box. And I'll just draw a line up. And then over, and then down, about like that. I'll come over here, and I'll do the same. And I'm going to just add some variation to how these posts look. Because again, I just want them to look like they're old, or do they just have some variation. Having just standard rectangles would be kind of boring. So we'll do one more here. And maybe just one more over here, just for good measure. OK, so now we have the post laid down. Next, we need to create the horizontal post. 
So let's click on the horizontal posts on the layers panel. And then starting with the far left post, we can just click and drag like this. And I'm just going to keep going like this from post to post. And the line, as you can tell, isn't going to be perfectly straight. Because again, I kind of want to add some variation. But of course, we need to close this off. So right about here, I'll just go down like this so that we are for sure now going to create a post that will be um, thicker than just one line, of course. And then we'll come back like this and like that. And then just finish it off like that. And now let's do that for two more. So we'll come down here a little bit and we can just add in the post. And I'm going to just adjust my line um, angle a little bit so it doesn't completely copy the line up here. So like this. And then maybe a little bit like that. And then like that. And then loop down. And come back like this. And then one more. So just go over. Like that. Okay. So now, if you want to again, to again see what this looks like so far, you can just go to File, Preview, or you can use Control-R if you're on a PC, or Command-R if you're on a Mac. But we'll go to Preview, and we can see now that the fence is now set. So we now have a fence for our background. So that works out pretty good. Next, let's add some background hills into the environment. So. I'll come down here and click on my sky. And then, again, on the right layers panel, just choose new layer and click vector. And we'll name this hills. And the reason why I had you click on the sky before you made it was so that the hills would appear ahead of the sky, but behind the ground and the fence. Of course, you could just drag this around whenever you need to. But I thought I would just show you that you can sort of set where you want your layers to go right away if you know where you want them to go. So once you've done that, we'll come over here to the Draw Shape tool. And at the top here, with our options, we'll choose Auto Stroke to be on, as well as Auto Fill. And we'll choose an oval. Now on the Style panel, which is, of course, on our right, we can click the Stroke color. And we'll make this a dark green. And then for the fill color, we want to make it a darker green than that of the ground currently, this ground right here. So something about like this will work. And click OK. So now, starting around here, I would say, of course, on the edge of your project, we'll just draw some ovals out. So like that. And like that. Again, this is really simple, and you could spend, you could definitely spend more time on this stuff. But given the uh, time constraint of the webinar, I'm just going to do some really simple shapes like that. So now, there are two things we want to do, or we can do, I should say. You don't have to do them, but I think it's good to do. First, I want to set these hills into the background. Now, you may think that we already did that with the layers, which is partially true. But Anime Studio actually has a real camera system built into it, a true 3D space camera system, to where we can actually push these things into the background. So then, when we have, let's say, a camera pan, um, the hills will move slower than that of the foreground objects, which is kind of how it goes in real life. When you see, let's say, something in the distance moving, it appears to move slower than that of something in the foreground. So it's really helpful for us to do that if you want to create some realistic looking movements. So in order to do this, let's click on the Translate Layer tool on our left toolbar. It's right under the Layer Settings. And then make sure that you are on the Hills layer, of course, on your right layer panel. And now at the top, you'll see that we have three options. 
X, Y, and Z. X will allow us to move the hills horizontally, Y will allow us to move them vertically, and Z will allow us to move them depth-wise, so basically into the background or into the foreground. So let's enter in negative 5 for the Z. You can see now that that snaps back and it looks smaller. However, if we come down here to the workspace area on our toolbar and click the orbit button, which is the last one, and then just click and move that around, you can see now that the hills are definitely in the background. And that is one way you can always test to see exactly where your layers are depth-wise when working on your projects. And of course, you could do this with any number of the objects. You could do it with the fence, you could do it with the ground. It just depends on how, you, how much depth you want to add to all the layers. So if you look at this view like I did, you can simply snap back by clicking on Reset View at the top of your menu. So now we'll want to resize the hills because they are smaller since they are in the background, or they appear smaller, that is. So all we have to do is click on the Scale Layer tool under our layer area on our toolbar and hold in Shift so that we resize portionately and just click and drag to resize the hills like that. And then with my Translate Layer tool next to the Scale Layer tool, I can just nudge them down a bit like so. So now we can add some depth of field to this. Depth of field is basically the technique where you have something in focus. So again, because Anime Studio has an actual camera, you can have the camera focus on specific things while blurring out other things. So in order to do this, there's actually two ways we can do it, and I'll show you both. First, go to File, Project Settings, and you'll look right in the middle of this um, window, you have depth of field. Click to enable that. You have a few options here. The focus distance basically um, dictates how far an object needs to be before it will go out of focus. The focus range works better for multiple um, layers that have multiple depths. So it doesn't really apply to us, but you have a range of basically how much um, depth you can have before a object goes out of focus. And the max blur shows us how much we can put something out of focus as far as how blurry it looks. So just enable this. You don't have to mess with any of those options. I'm just kind of telling you what they all do. And then click OK. Now, if we render this out or preview it, I can just go to Control-R, or you can go to File Preview if you wish. You can see now that the hills are blurred out, and that's because they are outside of the focal range. They're at negative 5. They're outside of that focal range, so they look blurry. The camera is more focused in on the foreground. Now, let me just undo that really quick, because I'll show you one more way. I'll just go to File, Project Settings, and just deselect Enabled on that depth of field, and then click OK. I'll now double click on the hills layer on my, of course, right layers panel. So just double click on the hills layer. And you have all sorts of options, but if you look where it says compositing effects, you have blur radius. So right here you could adjust this, let's say to 30, and click OK, and then render it out. As you can see, it is now blurry in the background. Now that has some uses. Again, it's different, but let's say if you move the camera itself, which you can do in Anime Studio, if you move it forward or backward, the depth of field will then act accordingly, of course, to that. So the depth of field is more automatic and it helps you along. This is more manual if you just have more of a still shot, if you just want to use the blur effects manually. Okay, so now that we have taken care of that, let's move on to drawing some clouds for the scenery. So I want to draw the clouds above the sky. So I'll just click on the sky layer on my right layers panel and go to New Layer, Vector. And I can name this Clouds and click Enter. There we go. So now 
You can add clouds and you can design clouds in a number of different ways, but I'll just use the add point tool for this. So I'll just click on the add point tool. And I'll make sure all these options are selected at the top except for sharp corners. Now I'll come over here to my right style panel and choose stroke. And I'll make this a bit of a darker gray. Not too dark, but just kind of an off whitish gray look. And then for the fill, I'll make it white. And I can zoom in a little bit here. And now starting right here, I'll just click and drag. And I'm just going to create kind of a skinny, wavy cloud. Again, you can make puppy clouds. You can make all sorts of clouds, different cloud types. It really just depends on how you want to draw it out. But there's one. We can do another here. It looks like that cloud kind of has a sharp edge there for some reason. And you can always fix things like that by clicking on your Translate Points tool, which is on your left toolbar, and then clicking on that point that might be giving you troubles and hitting the Delete key on your keyboard. You'll see that it pretty much, um, it looks like the cloud disappeared, but it didn't. I still have my lines here. I'll just eliminate that line and just come back in here and then just draw this out again like that. There we go. And I can add one more, a small one down here. Like that. And now looking at this, I could probably do a couple of different things here. Like I could click on this cloud with my translate points tool, which is what I just used to delete that point. It's right here on your toolbar. I can click on this cloud and move it around. And I can do the same with this one. And maybe this one, just to give it a little bit of variety so the clouds don't look like they're all lined up in a row. So now we have our clouds. And we can also do another thing here, too, with our layer effects. Because clouds aren't usually completely solid. So we can just double click on the clouds layer on our right layer panel. And in the compositing effects area, you'll see that you have an opacity setting. You can just um, add a number in here. The lower you go, the more transparent your cloud will be. So let's just add 60% and click OK. Now you won't see this effect take place right away on your work area. So all you have to do is just preview this again. I'll just use Control R. And you can see now that the clouds are a bit more transparent. We could also double click on those clouds, on that cloud layer again, and we could even add a blur to this. So let's put a blur radius of 10 and click OK, and then render that out. You can see now that they're a bit more blurry because the cloud, you know, probably isn't completely defined. And so that adds a little bit to our environment as well. I'm actually going to double click on my layers here and reduce this blur to 20 because I think those hills are a little bit too blurry. Um, just making a note and I'll render that out. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. I think they were a little bit too blurry before, so I'll go ahead and fix that. Okay, so now let's add some more details to this environment. Um, we could add trees, boulders. We can do all sorts of stuff. We can add grass. Um, you can draw that all out using your add point tool and you can do all of that. However, Anime Studio does have some built-in props that we can use to our advantage because they're there, so why not? So let's go to File, Import, Props. And right down here, you'll find a Scenery section. And you'll notice that you have all sorts of different things we can add. For instance, we could even add clouds if we didn't want to draw them out ourselves. But let's come down here to the trees. We have about five trees. So let's just click and add one in. So we have a tree right there. Um, it adds a layer. As you can see on our right layers panel, completely, it's just right there. We already have the layer in place. So let's move that layer above the ground, like that. And then take our translate layer tool and just nudge it up like this. 
And if we want to, we can resize the tree a bit, again, by taking the scale layer tool, which is right next to the translate layer tool on our left toolbar. And just nudge it down a bit like that. And go like that. So those are some things you can do. We can add another tree if we wish. Oops, I gotta go to props, scenery, and I'll go to tree one this time. And what we could do here, if we want to add some depth to the environment, using our translate layer tool, we could click up here on the Z axis and choose one and hit enter. And this brings the tree a little bit forward now into the camera. Because remember, we have the hills in the background. Now we're putting a one on here to bring it more forward to the camera. And we can then take this tree on the layers panel and bring it up, up past everything, and maybe even enlarge it a little bit now, making sure we're on that tree by taking the scale layers tool and just enlarging it a little bit and putting it right about here. And then we can use the depth of field settings in Anime Studio, or we can double click on that tree, come in here to the blur effects, which we're familiar with by now, and let's choose a blur radius of 30. Let's just try that and hit OK. And then we can render this out. And you can see now that we have a foreground tree, but it's, um, it's blurred out because the camera is more focused on what's going on in the other parts of the scene right here. And we can always adjust that blur a little bit more. I'll put it to about 20, actually, because, again, it was a little bit too blurry for my taste. But anyway, there's all sorts of things you can do. You can go to File, Import, and go to your Props and Scenery, and you can look at all sorts of different ones. You could add a boulder. You could add grass if you want to. If you just want more detail for the ground, there's all sorts of stuff you could do for that. So I would recommend that you play around with all that and see what you can find for all that stuff. Now, finally, I'll show you a couple more things that has to deal with that whole importing um, assets uh, area. First, let's save this file so that we don't lose it um, because we did a lot of work here. And it's always a good practice to save your work. So let's go to File and Save. And I'll just, um, I'm actually going to name mine Webinar 2, <laughs> but you should probably name yours something like your environment, um, outside environment, you know, something like that that's descriptive, and just hit Save. So now, once you've done that, let's go to File, New. We're just going to do a new document. And now go to File, Import, and then you, you can use Scenes. So Import Scenes, it's just below the props. And you can choose different environments to import in. If you want to do something just really quick, you can do animated environments or you can do still environments. So for instance, I could choose Forest 1 as my environment. And you can see we just bring in an entire scene just like that, and you have it's set as a group layer, so you can easily move it around and resize it to whatever your canvas size currently is. So like that, bring it up, and then you can just render it out, and you can have your environment just like that. It's all right there for you. Another thing you could do, too, I'll just make a new document. I'm not going to save this particular document, because all I did was import something. So I'll just go to File and New and just hit No if I want to save changes and then go to File, Import, Image. And I have an image right here already for us, so I'll just double click to bring it in. And as you can see, it's just an image of some outside scenery. And so that's another thing you could do too. Of course, vector graphics are more versatile, meaning you can't really do too much with this unless if you traced the image, which I kind of showed in the Q&A in my last lesson. But Again, you have those options, and the point about this is you really can just be really creative with it. You can mix images, vector graphics, you can bring in props, you can draw your own props, you can bring in scenery. It's really versatile, and that's what's great about Anime Studio. You can really have, you just have a lot of stuff available to you to work on your projects. But anyway, I think that about wraps it up. What I would suggest you do from here 
is yeah, go back to your scene that you saved and polish it up. Just do some polishing, add some details to it, see what else you can do with it. And if you want to, try to add some, um, or create, I should say, another environment entirely and add some more details to that. Maybe try making an interior environment and see how that works for you. Because again, the more time you spend polishing on it, the more happy you'll be with the final product. Anyway, that does it for me, and I guess we can take questions now. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, we have uh, several questions uh, that we'll get uh, started with, uh, but I just wanted to remind all the participants that uh, they can definitely feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section, uh, and as you ask the questions, uh, we'll try to get those answered. So uh, the first question that uh, came up is, uh, uh, is Anime Studio Debut 8 uh, capable of doing 3D camera options? I believe it is, yes. <clears throat> I'm using Pro right now, but yes, you do have the option to do camera movements in debut. Okay. Um, some of the some of the 3D uh, items are limited in uh, debut, just to, so I can mention that to uh, yes. some of our, uh, uh, our participants. Uh, most of the 3D ca capabilities have been geared more or less towards uh, the Pro option uh, or Anime Studio Pro, uh, including importing 3D objects and uh, and as well as moving around the canvas in 3D. Uh, the next question is. Uh, basically uh, about joining all the hill elements that you had uh, uh, previously in your, uh, uh, in, in your uh, presentation there. Um, he, he wanted to know if we could join all of those elements together into one complex shape. Yes, you, you, could, you could definitely do that. Um, I, I like to draw out the separate shapes, I guess, but one way you could do that, you could use you know, the add point tool and, and draw it that way. Um, as far as, you know, a complex shape, I, I guess I would, I, I kind of try to stay away from that kind of stuff, too. I, I try to use um, multiple layers, but um, if you wanted to, you could also use the group layer, too. That's one thing that I was kind of showing there as well. Um, but, yes, you could if you really wanted to. Again, there are, it, it kind of depends on how you draw it out, I would say. Again, with the add point tool or the freehand tool, you'd probably get more of that complex shape um, going on. So... So the next question is, how can we draw a desert-like scene with more than just one simple color for ground with some particles? Oh, yes. Um, there actually is a particle setting, actually, since you said particles, <laughs> in Anime Studio. You can, of course, do different particles. Actually, this is the scatter brush. But you can do all sorts of different things here as far as, like, leaves and landscape and all that kind of stuff. You can just kind of color it in, as you can see, we have different things going on here, um, which could help with a desert setting. I'm not sure if the mushrooms would really <laughs> apply to a desert setting, but basically, another thing you can do, too, though, is you could apply a gradient to the ground to add more um, detail to the ground, as you said, a color variation, or you can also import cactuses, or cactus, is that the, the, is that the correct plural pronunciation, cacti, I believe to so. Anime Studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, by just going to props and scenery, and you have all sorts of props in here, like you could add boulders and a cactus and so on to create some detail or variation to that. Okay, the next question is, uh, uh, will you be showing how to do named styles? Um, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Sure, it's, uh, will you be showing how to do named styles? Um, main styles or name styles? Name styles. Okay, main styles. Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, I'm trying to think. I, I think I, I think I refer to it something else. Um, are we talking about the style panel? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You mean like more of these? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, um, I can definitely show that. Um, we, we've kind of completed more of the drawing section now, but... Basically, I can just do a quick example on one, and it basically applies to all of them. So, for instance, let's say we are on the tree here. What you would do is you would take your Select Shape tool and click on one of the parts of the tree, for instance, let's say that part of the tree, and then you could go to your Style panel. And just like the gradient, you can apply it in any fashion. Let's, say, let's just go to Shaded. 
And now here in this panel, you can work with the shade effects. So we could adjust, let's say, the angle of the shade, something like that. You can adjust the blur and all that kind of stuff, and you click OK. And you can see now that we have a shade effect applied to that. So you could easily go back in and do that with all of your objects. Again, like we could apply a drop shadow to, I and mean, we probably wouldn't with the tree, but you know, we could apply it to drop shadow and click OK and do all that kind of stuff. So really, once you do one style effect, like the gradients, you pretty much know how to do them all. It's just a simple matter of just kind of tweaking with them. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question that came in that says, uh, can you do this? Uh, your your presentation in Anime uh, Debut 6, Anime Studio Debut 6, and I'll just answer that and I'll say yes. Uh, most of uh, the features that uh, Chad has explained, uh, uh, they're definitely possible in Anime Studio 6. Um, the next question is a little bit longer, so I'm going to read it to you. Okay. Uh, I have trouble taking a shape, uh, say circle, adding points with point tool that are not within the natural shapes line, and then joining it to the circle shape so that the original shape and the new extended lines can have their own width set equally. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to think that one in my head. Um, you may have to read that one one more time to me. <laughs> no, no, I'll just one more time. I had trouble uh, taking a shape, uh, okay. adding points with point tool that are not within the natural shapes line, and then joining it to the circle shape so that the original shape and the new extended lines can have their own width set equally. Oh, okay. I, I kind of see what's going on. So basically, and then kind of. So I'm, I'm assuming it kind of went something like this, and then he added and he connected it. I'm assuming, and then he can't do different, um, yeah, line widths. Well, th that one. I'm trying to think how we can how we can solve that one because basically, when you apply one line width, what you could do um, is you could try using the taper tool or the line width tool. I always call it the taper tool. It's right here under your fill section. So let's say you have, I don't really have that point connected. Well, let's just, we'll just say that they're, connect, they're connected right there. Um, what we could do then is we could take the add points tool and let's say we want this part right here a different width completely. Well, you could just take your taper tool or your line width tool and come in here and let's say you want it to be two. And then we can just add this one as two as well. And as you can see right there, it's a different line width than the rest. So I think it's mainly just a matter of using that line width tool and applying the points where you need them. I hope that uh, makes sense. <laughs> okay, thank you. The next question is, uh, how do you do a group layer? A group layer? Okay. Um, the group layers were basically what I was showing right here with the folders, but all you have to do to make a group layer is you go into your new layer um, setting, which is on that new layer button right there, and choose group. And then you can name the layer whatever you want. So we can just name it new group layer just for this demonstration. And then from there, you add whatever layers you want into it to group. So we can add the trees, Let's say we want to add all our trees into this group for layer for whatever reason. So we just draw, um, just put those layers into that group layer. So now, basically, the group layer allows us just to organize these so that they're in one layer. And also, the biggest, I would say, advantage is you can click on that group layer and then move all those layers around. Actually, I have all that stuff on my tree layers right now. That's why you see those moving, because I wasn't um, making new layers for that. But that's what the purpose of that is. It's basically to organize and allow you to move things easier. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you make backgrounds loop? Yes, um, you can. I, um, you would use the cycle ability um, when it comes to the tweeting um, down here. I, have a, I don't have any animation on here. I, I guess the best way for me to answer that is I actually have a tutorial on that. <laughs> so instead of trying to explain it here, it might be best for um, the viewer to go to my YouTube channel or IncredibleTutorials.com and look in the Anime Studio section. I have a looping background tutorial, and it shows how to use that cycle ability. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, I would like to understand how the size of what's rendered and the square used to draw 
within works. I'm a little fuzzy with that. So it's basically the purple parameter. Okay. Basically, um, it can be a little confusing because I have all this stuff on the screen right now. It can probably be a little bit overwhelming. But the best thing to remember is that as long as it's in the purple boundary, you will see it in your movie. This will allow you to hide things too. Let's say I don't want, um, I'm going to take my trees out of these group layers just for sake of showing. Let's say you don't want uh, this tree on the scene anymore, but you want to use it later or you wanted to use it for a reference. You can just, um, oh, geez, this tree. You can just move it out. And when we render now, you can see that it's no longer in that um, view. You can't see it because it's outside of the boundaries. But you can also work outside the boundaries if you just want to work on something, but you don't want it to be shown up quite yet. You can keep it there on the sidelines, bring it in later, or you can just keep it there as a reference, or you can delete it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question that uh, I'll answer. Um, uh, when importing backgrounds from Manga Studio to Anime Studio Pro, uh, do all the layers have to be vector layers? Uh, no, none of the layers have to be vector layers, uh, but I would recommend saving in PSD format and then importing into Anime Studio Pro in PSD format. So that answers that question. Um, so the other question that's uh, come up here is, uh, what are some of the other uh, complementary programs that the Anime Studio works well with? Well, one thing that one that comes to mind right off the bat, well, I guess you <coughs> mentioned Manga Studio, which um, you can import things in. I know uh, Photoshop, I can you can import um, Photoshop documents in. So if you work in Photoshop, you can import those in. I believe you can do that with Debut, but I don't believe it imports every individual layer with Photoshop but I think you can do that with both versions of Anime Studio to an extent. Um, the other one is Poser. As far as I, um, I'd use Poser a little bit. And um, it's, it's really useful because you can create 3D objects and then bring them into Anime Studio with the Poser, I think, 3D model extension. And then, of course, you can then use that with the camera movement, movements and all that. But I believe that's only a pro version um, feature, so. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there a default size for the workspace? If I created a background in Illustrator to import it, what size would I make it? Um, yes. Um, I probably should have covered that in lesson one, and I apologize that I didn't. What you can do is you can go to File, Project Settings, and right here is your dimensions. So before you even begin, um, your project, you could set the dimensions here, and then when you're in Illustrator, you could match those dimensions accordingly, and then you could bring those in. And of course, you can adjust this anyway, and there's all these presets you can do, and so on. So you can definitely adjust the dimensions so that you know what to do in Illustrator or any other program that you want to import from. Okay, excellent. Um, another question that I have is, how much stuff uh, should one place uh, in the background before it gets too uh, uh, too busy. Well, that's a good question. Actually, that's um, <laughs> it's kind of a cop out, but I think that's kind of up to the artist. Um, as far as getting too busy, as far as Anime Studio, I guess not being able to take all those assets because that happens with any program. I know with Flash, I use that, and sometimes with Anime Studio, if you have a lot of details it can really slow down your workflow because it's trying to keep all the graphics in line and all that. As far as a visually pleasing background, I guess that just depends on your view. Um, if you like things that are really detailed, you probably want more back there. Mine's more simplistic for this particular one. I just have grass and hills. It might seem plain for some people, so that's why I kind of mentioned you may want to go in and do some stuff. But artistically, um, I think that's up to the artist. Um, as far as anime studio, like from a um, technical standpoint, you know, I, I think vector graphics um, don't slow it down too much, but when you start getting in the images and the video files and all that stuff, that's when you'll start seeing some slowdown with uh, the program. Okay. Another question just came up is, uh, can you import from a landscape generator like Terragen? Um, I'm actually, I actually don't know. 
<laughs> That's one I don't actually know. Do you know that? Uh, uh, to that? It, it, it depends. If uh, the files that come in are OBJ files in Anime Studio Pro, then it should uh, be able to uh, be imported in Anime Studio Pro. But if uh, if you can render them in uh, image formats or PSD formats, then that's another alternative to bring in uh, files from other programs. So those are the standard sort of files that most uh, 3D, 2D uh, programs allow you to export in. So it should be possible. Maybe not in the natural um, sort of uh, format that Terrigen exports to, but all these other formats should work. So I have another question uh, for you, Chad. Um, now that uh, you've created a background, where, where about do you place your character with respect to uh, uh, to your background? Well, that just it kind of depends on what you want to do. And the next lesson will focus on mostly getting our characters ready. The fourth lesson will focus more on you know putting the character into this environment and having them do things. Um, but I mean, you know, I guess. If it depends, like if you have them walking, you could probably start them here and have them walk this way. If you have them standing, you probably don't want him, you know, in the way of the tree or the tree in the way of him or her, I should say. So you could have the character right there. It really depends on what you want, plan to do with the scene. Um, if you're doing a looping background, you might want to have the character in the center and then have the background move, you know, with him. Um, so he's completely centered, but the background moves to look, look like the camera's walking with him. So those many things we'll do with that, and I'll be showing that, of course, in lesson four, and I'll show you guys some examples of that. Okay, thank you. We have a couple uh, more questions here that I'll try to get answered, and then afterwards uh, we'll wrap uh, the webinar up. We've reached uh, close to our uh, one-hour allotment. Um, so the next question is, uh, how can you make the trees look like they have leaves, not just a solid green color? Well, you could... Um, of course, go in there and draw them out. Or I do know, I think I was just using it actually, the scatter brush um, has leaves right here. I actually haven't used this very much, but we can see what it looks like here. I'll just go to this layer. But you mean, this is different colored leaves. This might be working for like a fall setting. But you could go in and do this type of thing. And then you could go in and individually color them if you want to. Um, have them one color or a variant of, let's say, a green. You could have different green leaves going on. But the best way, you know, um, would be to just kind of come in and draw it out, um, draw out the leaves with your Add Point tool. You can just kind of go in and you could kind of bubble these up. You could add details within. And you could just kind of look at these as a reference if you want to to see how to draw the leaves. Or you could look at other leaves in different images and just kind of draw it all out. Okay, thank you. So we're down to our last question here, um, and, then, and then we'll wrap up uh, the webinar. Uh, so what about buildings? Um, if, you, uh, if you'd like to uh, use buildings in your background, uh, how about you go uh, in creating buildings or importing buildings? Yeah, um, well, it's, it's pretty much the same concept, you know, with, um, I'm actually not, I'm going to look here really quick. I don't know offhand if the, um, if there are buildings actually in the uh, area here for importing. I don't, I don't see any. I might be wrong, though, um, as far as that. I know there's scenes that have buildings, like you have buildings here. But basically, you could use the, let's say, the draw shape tool and make it a rectangle. And you could maybe start drawing some skyscraper type things. And well, for instance, with my, um, I have a cartoon series called Mr. Bennett's Class. I did it all with the Add Point tool. You'll see in the beginning there's a shot of the school or a shot of something else, a, a house. I actually did that all with the Add Point tool. You just kind of take the Add Point tool and you just, like the leaves, you just kind of design it. Um, you might, if you're new to all this, it might be best to look at maybe at a picture. Maybe take a picture of your own house or a picture of a building you want to emulate and look at that and you can then use it as a reference. That's what that would be my advice because again, it's kind of like anything you draw. You kind of just have to practice on it and just you know just really um, fill it out as you're doing it. So uh, I wanted to say thank you very much uh, to Chad for taking the time um, to uh, uh, to to go over uh, all the different things related to scener creating sceneries in Anime Studio. And I wanted to thank everyone else for attending. Uh, we really apologize for all the technical difficulties that we had. Uh, it, it happens, unfortunately, with WebEx. Uh, we try to mitigate the issues, but there's always uh, new things that occur. Um, so this event was recorded, and it will be 
posted on our website. Um, so uh, please stay tuned and make sure to check out uh, my.smithmicro.com uh, forward slash webinars. Uh, as well, if you want some more information on Anime Studio, uh, please uh, go to anime.smithmicro.com. Uh, if you'd like to uh, check out some more of uh, uh, Chad's tutorials, he's got a ton of tutorials on Anime Studio. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing the stuff that he's put together. I would recommend going to IncredibleTutorials.com um, to get some more information uh, on some of his tutorials and to view some more stuff. Uh, so please check out his website. Uh, as well, uh, Chad has uh, put together a comprehensive 11 and a half hour tutorial series called Steve and the Alien. I would definitely uh, go uh, check that out for more information uh, and to you know hone up your skills on Anime Studio. So uh, with that, I'll go to the next slide here, and uh, I want to let everyone know that uh, we would love for you to subscribe to our email list. So please go to my.smithmicro.com forward slash deals forward slash email underscore list dot html. Uh, so uh, if you sign up uh, there, you'll have access to uh, uh, information regarding Anime Studio. There will be news about it. And there will also be deals on uh, on the pro version of the product as well as the view if you're interested in upgrading. As well, uh, if you're a student or an instructor, you can definitely uh, check out educational pricing uh, and uh, receive more information. So uh, please go to my.smithmicro.com forward slash campus for that. And with that, I thank everyone for their time, and we look forward to seeing you next week for Lesson 3 with Chad, uh, and uh, have a great day.